Hey sweet friends, I am thrilled to share with you our latest installment of the BFG, starting with chapter 19, The Queen. Dawn came at last, and the rim of a lemon-colored sun rose up behind the rooftop somewhere behind Victoria Station. A while later, Sophie felt a little of its warmth on her back and was grateful. In the distance, she heard a church clock striking. She counted the strikes. There were seven. She found it almost impossible to believe that she, Sophie, a little orphan of no real importance in the world, was at this moment actually sitting high above the ground on the windowsill of the Queen of England's bedroom, with the Queen herself asleep in there behind the curtain not more than five yards away. The very idea of it was absurd. No one had ever done such a thing before. It was a terrifying thing to be doing. What would happen if the dream didn't work? No one, least of all the queen, would believe a word of her story. It seemed possible that nobody had ever woken up to find a small child sitting behind the curtains on his or her windowsill. The queen was bound to get a shock. Who wouldn't? With all the patience of a small girl who has something important to wait for, Sophie sat motionless on the windowsill. How much longer, she wondered. What time do queens wake up? Faint stirrings and distant sounds came to her from deep inside the belly of the palace. Then, all at once, beyond the curtains, she heard the voice of the sleeper in the bedroom. It was a slightly blurred sleep talker's voice. Oh no, it cried, no, don't. Someone stop them. Don't let them do it. I, I can't bear it. Oh, please stop them. It's horrible. Oh, it's ghastly. No, no, no. She is having the dream, Sophie told herself. It must be really horrid. I feel so sorry for her, but it has to be done. After that, there were a few moans. Then there was a long silence. Sophie waited. She looked over her shoulder. She was terrified that she would see the man with the dog down in the garden staring up at her. But the garden was deserted. A pale summer mist hung over it like smoke. It was an enormous garden, very beautiful with a large funny shaped lake at the far end. There was an island in the lake and there were ducks swimming on the water. Inside the room, beyond the curtains, Sophie suddenly heard what was obviously a knock on the door. She heard the doorknob being turned. She heard someone entering the room. Good morning, your majesty, a woman was saying. It was the voice of an oldish person. There was a pause and then a slight rattle of china and silver. Will you have your tray on the bed, ma'am, or on the table? Oh, Mary! Something awful has just happened. This was a voice Sophie had heard many times on radio and television, especially on Christmas Day. It was a very well-known voice. Whatever is it, ma'am? I've just had the most frightful dream. It was a nightmare. It was awful. Oh, I am sorry, ma'am, but don't be distressed. You're awake now and it will go away. It was only a dream, ma'am. Do you know what I dreamt, Mary? I dreamt that girls and boys were being snatched out of their beds at boarding school and were being eaten by the most ghastly giants. The giants were putting their arms in through the dormitory windows and plucking the children out with their fingers. One lot from a girl's school and another from a boy's school. It was all so, so vivid, Mary. It was so real. There was silence. Sophie waited. She was quivering with excitement. But why the silence? Why didn't the other one, the maid, why didn't she say something? What on earth's the matter, Mary? The famous voice was saying. There was another silence. Mary, you've gone as white as a sheet. Are you feeling ill? There was suddenly a crash and a clatter of crockery which could only have meant that the tray the maid was carrying had fallen out of her hands. Mary, the famous voice was saying rather sharply, I think you'd better sit down at once. You look as if you're going to faint. 
You really mustn't take it so hard just because I've had an awful dream. That, that, that isn't the reason, ma'am. The maid's voice was quivering terribly. Then for heaven's sake, what is the reason? I'm very sorry about the tray, ma'am. Oh, don't worry about the tray. But what on earth is it that made you drop it? Why did you go white as a ghost all of a sudden? You haven't seen the papers yet, have you, ma'am? No, what do they say? Sophie heard the rustling of a newspaper as it was being handed over. It's like the very dream you had in the night, ma'am. Rubbish, Mary, where is it? On the front page, ma'am, it's the big headlines. Great Scott, cried the famous voice. Eighteen girls vanish mysteriously from their beds at Rodine School. Fourteen boys disappear from Eton. Bones are found underneath dormitory windows. Then there was a pause, punctuated by gasps from the famous voice as the newspaper article was clearly being read and digested. Oh, how ghastly, the famous voice cried out. It's absolutely frightful. Bones under the windows? What can have happened? Oh, those poor children. But ma'am, don't you see, ma'am? See what, Mary? Those children were taken away almost exactly as you dreamt it, ma'am. Not by giants, Mary. No, ma'am, but the bit about the girls and boys disappearing from their dormitories... You dreamt it so clearly, and then it actually happened. That's why I came over all queer, ma'am. I'm coming over a bit queer myself, Mary. It gives me the shakes, ma'am, when something like that happens. It really does. I don't blame you, Mary. I shall get you some more breakfast, ma'am, and have this mess cleared up. No, don't go, Mary. Stay here for a moment. Sophie wished she could go into the room, but she didn't dare touch the curtains. The famous voice began speaking again. I really did dream about those children, Mary. It was clear as crystal. I know you did, ma'am. I don't know how giants got into it. That was rubbish. Shall I draw the curtains, ma'am? Then we shall all feel better. It's a lovely day. Please do. With a swish, the great curtains were pulled aside. The maid screamed. Sophie froze to the window ledge. The queen, sitting up in her bed with the times on her lap, glanced up sharply. Now it was her turn to freeze. She didn't scream as the maid had done. Queens are too self-controlled for that. She simply sat there, staring wide-eyed and white-faced at the small girl who was perched on her, her windowsill in a nighty. Sophie was petrified. Curiously enough, the queen looked petrified too. One would have expected her to look surprised, as, or I, as you or I would have done had we discovered a small girl sitting on her windowsill first thing in the morning. But the queen didn't look surprised. She looked genuinely frightened. The maid, a middle-aged woman with a funny cap on the top of her head, was the first to recover. What in the name of heaven do you think you're doing in here? She shouted angrily to Sophie. Sophie looked beseechingly towards the queen for help. The queen was still staring at Sophie. Gaping at her would be more accurate. Her mouth was slightly open. Her eyes were round and wide as two saucers. And the whole of that famous, rather lovely face was filled with disbelief. Now listen here, young lady. How on earth did you get into this room? The maid shouted furiously. I, I don't believe it, the queen was murmuring. I, I simply don't believe it. I'll take her out, ma'am, at once, the maid was saying. No, Mary, no, don't do that. The queen spoke so sharply that the maid was quite taken aback. She turned and stared at the queen. What on earth had come over her? It looked as though she was in a state of shock. Are you all right, ma'am? The maid was saying. When the queen spoke again, it was in a strange, strangled sort of whisper. 
Tell me, Mary, she said, tell me quite truthfully, is there really a little girl sitting on my windowsill, or am I still dreaming? She is sitting there all right, ma'am, as clear as daylight, but heaven only knows how she got there. Your majesty is certainly not dreaming at this time. But that's exactly what I did dream, the queen cried out. I dreamt that as well. I dreamt there would be a little girl sitting on my windowsill in her nightie, and she would talk to me. The maid, with her hands clasped across her starched white bosom, was staring at her mistress with a look of absolute disbelief on her face. The situation was getting beyond her. She was lost. She had not been trained to cope with this kind of madness. Are you real? the queen said to Sophie. Y yes, your majesty, Sophie stammered. What is your name? Sophie, your majesty. And how did you get up onto my windowsill? No, don't answer that. Hang on a moment. I dreamt that part of it too. I dreamed that a giant put you there. He did, your majesty, Sophie said. The maid gave a howl of anguish and clasped her hands over her face. Control yourself, Mary, the queen said sharply. Then to Sophie she said, You are not serious about the giant, are you? Oh, yes, your majesty. He's out there in the garden now. Is he indeed, the queen said. The sheer absurdity of it all was helping her to regain her composure. So he's in the garden, is he? She said, smiling a little. He is a good giant, your majesty, Sophie said. You need not be frightened of him. I'm delighted to hear it, said the queen, still smiling. He is my best friend, your majesty. How nice, the queen said. He's a lovely giant, your majesty. I'm quite sure he is, the queen said. But why have you and this giant come to see me? I think you have dreamed that part of it too, your majesty, Sophie said calmly. That pulled the queen up short. It took the smile right off her face. She certainly had dreamed that part of it. She was remembering now how, at the end of her dream, it had said that a little girl and a big friendly giant would come and show her how to find the nine horrible man-eating giants. There's Sophie sitting on the window seal. But be careful, the queen told herself. Keep very calm, because this is surely not very far from the place where madness begins. You did dream that, didn't you, your majesty? Sophie said. The maid was out of it now. She just stood there goggling. Yes, the queen murmured. Yes, now you come to mention it, I did. But how do you know what I dreamed? <clears throat> Sorry, guys. But how do you know what I dreamed? Oh, that's a long story, your majesty. Would you like me to call the big friendly giants? The queen looked at the child. The child looked straight back at the queen, her face open and quite serious. The queen simply didn't know what to make of it. Was someone pulling her leg, she wondered. Shall I call him for you, Sophie went on. You'll like him very much. The queen took a deep breath. She was glad no one except her faithful old Mary was here to see what was going on. Very well, she said. You may call your giant. No, wait a moment. Mary, pull yourself together and give me my dressing gown and slippers. The maid did as she was told. The queen got out of bed and put on a pale pink dressing gown and slippers. You may call him now, the queen said. Sophie turned her head towards the garden and called out, BFG, Her Majesty the Queen would like to see you. The Queen crossed over to the window and stood beside Sophie. Come down off that ledge, she said. You're going to fall backwards at any moment. Sophie jumped down into the room and stood beside the Queen at the open window. Mary, the maid, stood behind them. Her hands were now planted firmly on her hips, and there was a look on her face which seemed to say, I want no part of this fiasco. I don't see any giant, the queen said. Please wait, Sophie said. Shall I take her away now, ma'am, the maid said. 
Take her downstairs and give her some breakfast, the queen said. Just then, there was a rustle in the bushes beside the lake. Then out he came, 24 feet tall, wearing his black cloak with the grace of a nobleman, still carrying his long trumpet in one hand. He strode magnificently across the palace lawn towards the window. The maid screamed. The queen gasped. Sophie waved. The BFG took his time. He was very dignified in his approach. When he was close to the window where the three of them were standing, he stopped and made a slow, graceful bow. His head, after he had straightened up again, was almost exactly level with the watchers at the window. Your Majester, he said, I is your humbug servant, he bowed again. Considering she was meeting a giant for the very first time in her life, the queen remained astonishingly self-composed. We are very pleased to meet you, she said. Down below, a gardener was coming across the lawn with a wheelbarrow. He caught a sight of the BFG's legs over to his left. His gaze traveled slowly upwards along the entire height of the enormous body. He gripped the handles of the wheelbarrow. He swayed. He tottered. Then he keeled over on the grass in a dead faint. Nobody noticed him. Oh, Magister, cried the BFG. Oh, Queen. Oh, Moniker. Oh, Golden Sovereign. Oh, Ruler. Oh, Ruler of Straight Lines. Oh, Sultana. I has come here with my little friend Sophie to give you a... The BFG hesitated, searching for the word. To give me what? The queen said. Ah, uh, assistance, the BFG said, beaming. The queen looked puzzled. He sometimes speaks a bit funny, your majesty, Sophie said. He never went to school. Then we must send him to school, the queen said. We have some very good schools in this country. I has great secrets to tell your majester, the BFG said. I should be delighted to hear them, the queen said, but not in my dressing gown. Shall you wish to get dressed, ma'am, the maid said. Have either of you had breakfast, the queen said. Oh, could we? Sophie cried. Oh, please. I haven't eaten a thing since yesterday. I was about to have mine, the queen said, but Mary dropped it. The maid gulped. I imagine we have more food in the palace, the queen said, speaking to the BFG. Perhaps you and your little friend would care to join me. Will it be repulsant snozcumbers, Magister? The BFG asked. Will it be what? The queen said. Stinky snozcumbers, the BFG said. What is he talking about, the queen said. It sounds like a rude word to me. She turned to the maid and said, Mary, ask them to serve breakfast for three in the... I think it had better be in the ballroom. That has the highest ceiling. To the BFG, she said, I'm afraid you will have to go through the door on your hands and knees. I shall send someone to show you the way. The BFG reached up and lifted Sophie out of the window. You and I is leaving her magister alone to get dressed, he said. No, leave the little girl here with me, the queen said. We'll have to find something for her to put on. She can't have breakfast in her nighty. The BFG returned Sophie to the bedroom. Can we have sausages, your majesty, Sophie said, and bacon and fried eggs? I think that might be managed, the queen answered, smiling. Just you wait till you taste it, Sophie said to the BFG. No more snozcumbers from now on. Our second chapter for today is titled The Royal Breakfast. There was a frantic scurry among the palace servants when orders were received from the queen that a 24-foot giant must be seated with her majesty in the great ballroom within the next half hour. The butler, an imposing personage named Mr. Tibbs, was in supreme command of all the palace servants, and he did the best he could in the short time available. 
A man does not rise to become the queen's butler unless he is gifted with extraordinary ingenuity, adaptability, versatility, dexterity, cunning, sophistication, sagacity, discretion, and a host of other talents that neither you nor I possess. Mr. Tibbs had them all. He was in the butler's pantry sipping an early morning glass of milk when the order reached him. In a split second, he had made the following calculations in his head. If a normal six-foot man requ requires a three-foot high table to eat off of, a 24-foot giant will require a 12-foot high table. And if six footmen requires a chair with a two foot high seat, a 24 foot giant will require a chair with an eight foot high seat. Everything Mr. Tibbs told himself but me must be multiplied by four. Two breakfast eggs must become eight. Four rashers of bacon must become 16. Three pieces of toast must become 12 and so on. These calculations about food were immediately passed on to Monsieur Papillon, the royal chef. Mr. Tibbs skimmed into the ballroom. Butlers don't walk, they skim over the ground. Followed by a whole army of footmen. The footmen all wore knee breeches and every one of them displayed beautifully rounded calves and ankles. There is no way you can become a royal footman unless you have a well-turned well ankle. It is the first thing they look at when you are interviewed. Push the grand piano into the center of the room, Mr. Tibbs whispered. Butlers never raise their voices above the softest whisper. Four footmen moved the piano. Now fetch a large chest of drawers and put it on top of the piano, Mr. Tibbs whispered. Three other footmen fetched a very fine Chippendale mahogany chest of drawers and placed it on top of the piano. That will be his chair, Mr. Tibbs whispered. It is exactly eight feet off the ground. Now we shall make a table upon which this gentleman may eat his breakfast in comfort. Fetch me four very tall grandfather clocks. There are plenty of them around the palace. Let each clock be twelve feet high. Sixteen footmen spread out around the palace to find the clocks. They were not easy to carry and re required four footmen to each one. Place the four clocks in a rectangle eight feet by four along the grand piano, Mr. Tibbs whispered. The footmen did so. Now fetch me the young prince's ping-pong table, Mr. Tibbs whispered. The ping-pong table was carried in. Unscrew its legs and take them away, Mr. Tibbs whispered. This was done. Now place the ping-pong table on top of the four grandfather clocks, Mr. Tibbs whispered. To manage this, the footman had to stand on step ladders. Mr. Tibbs stood back to survey the new furniture. None of it is in the classic style, he whispered, but it will have to do. He gave orders that a damask tablecloth should be draped over the ping-pong table, and in the end, it looked really quite elegant after all. At this point, Mr. Tibbs was seen to hesitate. The footmen all stared at him, aghast. Butlers never hesitate, not even when they are faced with the most impossible problems. It is their job to be totally decisive at all times. Knives and forks and spoons, Mr. Tibbs was heard to mutter. Our cutlery will be like pins in his hands. Mr. Tibbs didn't hesitate for long. Tell the head gardener, he whispered, that I require immediately a brand new, unused garden fork and also a spade. And for a knife, we shall use the great sword hanging on the wall in the morning room but clean the sword well first. It was last used to cut off the head of King Charles I, and there will still be a little dry blood on the blade. When all this had been accomplished, Mr. Tibbs stood near the center of the ballroom, casting his expert butler's eye over the scene. Had he forgotten anything? He certainly had. What about a coffee cup for the large gentleman? Fetch me, he whispered, the biggest jug you can find in the kitchen. A splendid one-gallon porcelain water jug was brought in and placed on the giant's table beside the garden fork and the garden spade and the great sword. So much for the giant. 
Mr. Tibbs then had the footman move a small, delicate table and two chairs alongside the giant's table. This was for the queen and for Sophie. The fact that the giant's table and chair towered far above the smaller table simply could not be helped. All these arrangements were only just completed when the queen, now fully dressed in a trim skirt and cashmere cardigan, entered the ballroom holding Sophie by the hand. A pretty blue dress that had once belonged to one of the princesses had been found for Sophie, and to make her look prettier still, the queen had picked up a superb sapphire brooch from her dressing table and had pinned it on the left side of Sophie's chest. The big friendly giant followed behind them, but he had an awful job of getting through the door. He had to squeeze himself through on his hands and knees, with two footmen pushing him from behind and two pulling from the front. But he got through in the end. He had removed his black cloak and got rid of his trumpet and was now wearing his ordinary simple clothes. As he walked across the ballroom, he had to stoop quite a lot to avoid hitting the ceiling. Because of this, he failed to notice an enormous crystal chandelier. Crash went his head right into the chandelier. A shower of glass fell upon the poor BFG. Gunk hummers and bogs winkles, he cried. What was that? It was Louis the Fifteenth. the queen said, looking slightly put out. He's never been in the house before, Sophie said. Mr. Tibbs scowled. He directed four footmen to clear up the mess. Then, with a disdainful little wave of the hand, he indicated to the giant that he should seat himself on top of the chest of drawers on top of the grand piano. What a fizz-whizzing, flush-funking seat, cried the BFG. I is going to be bug as a snug in a rug up here. Does he always speak like that? The queen asked. Quite often, Sophie said, he gets tangled up with his words. The BFG sat down on the chest of drawers piano and gazed in wonder around the great ballroom. By gumdrops, he cried, what a spiffling wopsy room we is in. It is so gigantuous I is needing by circulars and telescopes to see what is going on at the other end. Footmen arrived carrying silver trays with fried eggs, bacon, sausages, and fried potatoes. There's the BFG crashing into the chandelier. At this point, Mr. Tibbs suddenly realized that in order to serve the BFG at his 12-foot-high grandfather clock table, he would have to climb to the top of one of the tall step ladders. What's more, he must do it balancing a huge warm plate on the palm of one hand and holding a gigantic silver coffee pot in the other. A normal man would have flinched at the thought of it, but good butlers never flinch. Up he went, up and up and up, while the queen and Sophie watched him with great interest. It is possible they were both secretly hoping he would lose his balance and go crashing to the floor, but good butlers never crash. At the top of the ladder, Mr. Tibbs, balancing like an acrobat, poured the BFG's coffee and placed the enormous plate before him. On the plate, there were eight eggs, 12 sausages, 16 rashers of bacon, and a heap of fried potatoes. What is this, please, your magister? The BFG asked, peering down at the queen. He has never eaten anything except snozcumbers before in his life, Sophie explained. They taste revolting. They don't seem to have stunted his growth, the queen said. The BFG grabbed the garden spade and scooped up all the eggs, sausages, bacon, and potatoes in one go and shoveled them into his enormous mouth. By goggles, he cried. This stuff is making snozcumbers taste like swatch wallop. The queen glanced up, frowning. Mr. Tibbs looked down at his toes and his lips moved in a silent prayer. That was only one titchy little bite, the BFG said. Is you having any more of this delunctious grovel in your cupboard, Magister? Tibbs, the queen said, showing true regal hospitality, 
fetch the gentleman another dozen fried eggs and a dozen sausages. Mr. Tibbs swam out of the room muttering unspeakable words to himself and wiping his brow with a white handkerchief. The BFG lifted the huge jug and took a swallow. Ouch, he cried, blowing a mouthful across the ballroom. Please, what is this horrible swig pill I is drinking, Magister? It's coffee, the queen told him, freshly roasted. It's filthsome, the BFG cried out. Where is the frog scottle? The what? the queen asked. Delumptious, fizzy frog scottle, the BFG answered. Everyone must be drinking frog scottle with breakfast, Magister. Then we can all be whiz-popping happily together afterwards. What does he mean, the queen said, frowning at Sophie. What is whiz-popping? Sophie kept a very straight face. BFG, she said, there is no frog scottle here and whiz-popping is strictly forbidden. What, cried the BFG, no frog scottle, no whiz-popping, no glumptious music, no boom, boom, boom. Absolutely not, Sophie told him firmly. If he wants to sing, please don't stop him, the queen said. He doesn't want to sing, Sophie said. He said he wants to make music, the queen went on. Shall I send for a violin? No, your majesty, Sophie said. He's only joking. A sly little smile crossed the BFG's face. Listen, he said, peering down at Sophie. If they isn't having any frog scottle here in the palace, I can still go whiz-popping perfectly well without it if I is trying hard enough. No, cried Sophie, don't. You're not to, I beg you. Music is very good for the digestion, the queen said. When I'm up in Scotland, they play the bagpipes outside the window while I'm eating. Do play something. I has her majesty's permission, cried the BFG, and all at once he let fly with the whiz popper that sounded as though a bomb had exploded in the room. The queen jumped. Whoopee, shouted the BFG. That is better than bagel pipes, is it not, magister? It took the queen a few seconds to get over the shock. I prefer the bagpipes, she said, but she couldn't stop herself smiling. During the next 20 minutes, a whole relay of footmen were kept busy, hurrying to and from the kitchen, carrying third helpings and fourth helpings and fifth helpings of fried eggs and sausages for the ravenous and delighted BFG. When the BFG had consumed his 72nd fried egg, Mr. Tibbs sidled up to the queen. He bent low from the waist and whispered in her ear, Chef sends his apologies, your majesty, and he says he has no more eggs in the kitchen. What's wrong with the hens, the queen said. Nothing's wrong with the hens, your majesty, Mr. Tibbs whispered. Then tell them to lay more, the queen said. She looked up at the BFG. Have some toast and marmalade while you're waiting, she said to him. The toast is finished, Mr. Tibbs whispered, and Chef says there's no more bread. Tell him to bake more, the queen said. While all this was going on, Sophie had been telling the queen everything, absolutely everything about her visit to giant country. The queen listened appalled. When Sophie had finished, the queen looked up at the BFG who was sitting high above her. He was now eating a sponge cake. Big friendly giant, she said, last night those man-eating brutes came to England. Can you remember where they went the night before? The BFG put a whole round sponge cake into his mouth and chewed it slowly while he thought about this question. Yes, Magister, he said. I do think I is remembering where they said they were going the night before last. They was galloping off to Sweden for the sweet and sour taste. Fetch me a telephone, the queen commanded. Mr. Tibbs placed the instrument on the table. The queen lifted the receiver. Get me the king of Sweden, she said. Good morning, the queen said. Is everything all right in Sweden? Everything is terrible, the king of Sweden answered. There is panic in the capital. Two nights ago, 26 of my loyal subjects disappeared. My whole country is in a panic. Your 26 loyal subjects were all eaten by giants, the queen said. Apparently, they like the taste of Swedes.
Why do they like the taste of Swedes? The king asked. Because the Swedes of Sweden have a sweet and sour taste. So says the BFG, the queen says. I don't know what you're talking about, the king said, growing testy. It's hardly a joking matter when one's loyal subjects are being eaten like popcorn. They've eaten mine as well, the queen said. Who's they, for heaven's sake, the king asked. Giants, the queen said. Look here, the king said. Are you feeling all right? It's been a rough morning, the queen said. First I had a horrid nightmare, then the maid dropped my breakfast, and now I've got a giant on the piano. You need a doctor quick, cried the king. I'll be all right, the queen said. I must go now. Thanks for your help. She replaced the receiver. Your BFG is right, the queen said to Sophie. Those nine man-eating brutes did go to Sweden. It's horrible, Sophie said. Please stop them, your majesty. I'd like to make one more check before I call out the troops, the queen said. Once more, she looked up at the BFG. He was eating donuts now, popping them into his mouth ten at a time like peas. Think hard, BFG, she said. Where did those horrid giants say they were galloping off to three nights ago? The BFG thought long and hard. Ho, ho, he cried at last. Yes, I is remembering. Where? asked the queen. One was off to Baghdad, the BFG said. As they is galloping past my cave, Flesh Lump Eater is waving his arms and shouting at me. I is off to Baghdad, and I is going to Baghdad, Ma Baghdad, and Mom, and every one of their ten children as well. Once more, the queen lifted the receiver. Get me the Lord Mayor of Baghdad, she said. If they don't have a Lord Mayor, get me the next best thing. In five seconds, a voice was on the line. Here is the Sultan of Baghdad speaking, the voice said. Listen, Sultan, the queen said. Did anything unpleasant happen in your city three nights ago? Every night unpleasant things are happening in Baghdad, the Sultan said. We are chopping off people's heads like you are chopping parsley. I've never chopped parsley in my life, the queen said. I want to know if anyone has disappeared recently in Baghdad. Only my uncle, Khalif Harun al-Rashid, the sultan said. He disappeared from his bed and three nights ago together with his wife and ten children. There you is, cried the BFG, whose wonderful ears enabled him to hear what the sultan was saying to the queen on the telephone. Flesh Lump Eater did that one. He went off to Baghdad to Baghdad and Mom and all the little kittles. The queen replaced the receiver. That proves it, she said, looking up at the BFG. Your story is apparently quite true. Summon the head of the army and the head of the Air Force immediately. And that's all for today, friends. Can't wait, wait to see you tomorrow for our next installment of the BFG.